It's podcast number 34 at joettecalories.com, and we've got another Dads with Audacity interview for you. Each day from my office, I get to see how homeopathy is transforming lives all over the globe, and I want to share them with you. Some of my students have really caught my eye. Some of you have done all you can to learn how to cure those around you using homeopathic medicines, and your successes inspire me. They're glorious and powerful, and I can't keep these successes a secret any longer. So, with help from my roving reporters, we bring you a mini podcast series that I call Moms with Moxie, and sometimes we even interview dads with audacity. See how regular mothers and others, average people who want to cure those around them, have gone from freaking to fabulous with homeopathy. All right, for today's podcast, we are actually shifting gears a little bit. And I'm your host today, Paola Brown. This is going to be our longest podcast, so you for sure need to save it in the queue next time you're going to be on a long drive or you're folding laundry or um, definitely if you're near your husband, you guys have some downtime together. But in today's podcast, I am interviewing three dads with Audacity. The first guy is Casey. I quite enjoyed Casey, and and an interesting thing about him is he snuck into the background of one of the study group classes I taught. I usually teach it online, and so he was sitting off camera enjoying my class. When I found out about that, I was really excited, and I I begged him to please, you know, um, be on the podcast. So you'll really enjoy Casey's interview. Next, we have Mark from New York, and Mark is an avid sports guy, and he talks a lot about how homeopathy fits into his life with his sports and with his family. And the final interview we have today is a top secret interview. His name is Levi, and I don't reveal who Levi is until the very end of the podcast. So until then, I'll let you try and guess why I think this dad with audacity is so awesome. All right, here we go from the top with Casey. I am excited to have a Dads with Audacity podcast today, and I'm here with Casey. He's from Texas, and he is a father of how many kids, Casey? We have three kids. Three kids. And um, I know your wife actually took the homeopathy study group class that Joette offers. Um, She purchased the curriculum and participated in that. So that's great. So tell us about that class. Your wife was taking it. And where were you during that time? (laughs) I was looking over her shoulder for a lot of it. (laughs) I was listening in when I could to see what I could learn. And uh, we were making notes. And uh, yeah, it was very informative. And we we learned quite a bit. To be honest, it was kind of like hitting the fast forward button and uh, kind of soaked a lot in uh, quickly. So it was incredibly helpful. Good. That's awesome. So I was actually teaching the class for your wife. And I remember we ran into you guys and she introduced herself to me. Oh, I'm, I'm Carly. I'm in your class. And then I realized, and she says, my husband's been sitting off camera listening to your class too. And I think, Casey, you were my first official male that has ever taken my study group class with me. So I thought that was pretty cool. I don't know if that's good or bad, but yeah, well, I, I guess I'm honored. <laughs> well, tell us, why do you think that is the case that so many dads aren't as interested in homeopathy? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to go back in a little further to even explain how we arrived at, at homeopathy and how okay. we even learned about it. It probably started for me well over seven or eight years ago. It was more about a, just a, a journey to be healthy. My wife and I, for an anniversary trip, flew to uh, San Francisco and drove our way down the coast to LA. When I say drove, what I really should say is we ate our way down the coast. (laughs) And so it was that typical vacation, you know, anniversary trip where a lot of it was about the food. Yeah, absolutely. And when we got home, I kind of took a look in the mirror and realized I was uh, into my 30s now and I (laughs) couldn't exactly eat and do what I wanted to do. There were going to be consequences for some of my decisions. So metabolism is a little different in your 30s. It had changed. Yeah, Yeah. it slowed down a little bit. And coupled that with working at a desk and uh, I was drinking a lot of sodas, you know, Dr. Pepper was my soda of choice. I was still fairly active. I still like to hang out with the guys and play golf, play softball, things like that. But I didn't really have a fitness mindset. And so Mm -hmm. I just on a whim decided, you know what, I'm going to see what I can do to get healthy here. So I cut out the sodas and I signed up for a triathlon. I had never done one. My friends had done them. I thought, all right, I knew I had to pay for the triathlon. Like I had to get Mm -hmm. some skin in the game if I was going to actually go for a run or a swim or ride my bike. And so I did that. 
and eight weeks later did the triathlon. It was just a short sprint triathlon for fun. And I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. And so then I realized they kind of, they time you, you have like a time where you fall in your age group. And I thought, Hmm, what could I do to improve? Could I train harder? Could I change some other things? And one of the first things I looked at was diet. What am I eating? I didn't really change what I was eating all that much for the training. And so then I started experimenting and, and reading about the vegan diet, a paleo diet, you know, all these different kinds of, of healthy eating. And so I started watching a lot of documentaries and things like that just to try to educate myself. And so that was the first time it really started questioning and at least looking at what I was putting in my body in terms of food. So that started a cool journey of getting fit and trying to be healthy and watching what I eat and looking at food as fuel from a nutrition standpoint. Right. I think that's a similar journey to anyone who has come to homeopathy specifically. The gateway is starting with diet. I read this quote once and it says, you cannot outrun an unhealthy diet. And that really kind of hit me. I used to think, well, I'll have a soda and I'll run a couple of miles and that will neutralize the soda, but that's not how it works. It's doing damage in your body that you can't outrun. That's good. How'd you do in the triathlon? Were you happy with the results? I did pretty well in the triathlon. My first goal was to finish and I did that. And then from there, I've probably done, I don't know, another dozen triathlons, 5Ks. I do a couple a year now. Keeps me training, keeps me active Mm -hmm. and things like that. But um, but the, the nutrition part was the first time I questioned what I put in my body from a food standpoint. And then it kind of grew from there. Then it was looking at other things that I was putting in my body, just things that I took for granted. I say in my body, I could even say on my body. So it's like, I would put deodorant on and I'm thinking, what is in this? I don't even know what's in this deodorant or getting a cold and taking an over-the-counter medication. I have no idea what is in this. I started looking at my food, but I'm not looking at anything else, whether I'm washing my hair or washing my clothes or anything else. So it was more of just questioning. I'm not saying any of those things are bad. It was just me personally kind of wondering, what is this doing to my body? The things that I'm putting on and in. And so I think our journey just started there. It was food and then it it moved over into other areas. And uh, that's when we kind of arrived at the medicines. My wife kind of ventured into oils, which was Mm -hmm. great. There were some things that we applied there. And that was a bit of a gateway into homeopathy, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's the crossover. I always say that the oily people, the people who do their oils, they're the best crossover group to get into homeopathy because they're looking for independence and they're looking for alternatives. I have to say, one of my, like, little pet peeves and I don't usually get too annoyed I'm pretty easygoing but one of my little pet peeves whenever someone has a headache I'm like oh you know maybe you should try some bryonia or if it's a tension headache try some arnica montana or you wake up in the morning and you've slept wrong and you're like oh my neck hurts so I have this really bad headache I slept wrong that's a roost tox headache so sometimes when people mention their headaches to me I'm like oh would you like to try one of these guys and then now they're all of a sudden very skeptical They're like, what's in this? What is this homeopathic? I'm like, do you even do that to Tylenol or to all the other stuff that you're taking? It's more of like this cultural acceptance over actual facts that help you make an informed decision. It's true. Well, good for you. I'm very impressed that you crossed over from food to even the medicine because I feel like that's kind of a leap for some people, but it's very logical for you to do that. So good job. So your wife came home saying that she wanted to take the homeopathy study group class or, or what happened? Were you guys seeking something or were you pretty satisfied where you were with your diet and your oils? The oils left a little to be desired in terms of, I felt like they worked well for things that were topical and, and things like that. And I know there are people who say they've had success from taking them in other ways, but mm-hmm. uh, I think we were looking for something a little different to replace medication, I'll say. Right. Um, If you go stand in a drugstore, you've got shelves and shelves of whatever ailment you're needing help with. I felt like we needed something to replace that. And then also wondering if we even should be taking something for a particular ailment, that sort of thing. And we did a lot of reading. We read a few books and stood in front of some health stores that carried different remedies. All those little vials were very confusing. (laughs) It was a a lot to, to look at there and it was a bit overwhelming. And that's when my wife... I discovered the course. And so I think that kind of came along at just the right time where we were able to start making notes and start learning and writing things down. There's a lot of information out on the internet. You can do a lot of good reading, but the course was something for us that kind of, um, to hear it from someone else and to hear someone else's experiences really helped us out. We still reference the notes from that class all the time. Yeah. Awesome. I think that's what's so cool about the study group class Two things, you really don't need to take a class with someone. You can just start your own group and the book walks you right through it. But if you take it with someone who 
has had a little bit of experience with homeopathy, that's also a good option because they have all the experiences in the story that kind of illustrate how wonderful these little remedies work. And you're right, they are overwhelming. I have a friend who has said, when I went to Whole Foods and I saw all those little blue boron homeopathic single remedy bottles, I thought that they were for practitioners. Like I thought that that was something that I wasn't even going to be allowed to buy. I thought I was going to have to show some sort of license to buy it because it is so overwhelming and so foreign. So your wife started taking the class and you're kind of off camera listening. And she has told me that your support in the family's homeopathy journey has been integral for her. Can you talk about that and maybe kind of what challenges you guys faced together and why being a team player in the situation was good for you guys? Yeah, I think we both had to be committed to it for a couple of reasons. Number one, to uh, keep each other strong, because when you've got a child who's not feeling well at three in the morning and standing next to your bed, yep. it's easy to go get something different out of the medicine cabinet. So uh, if you're both on the same page, it, it really helps when you can get the notes open. Let's figure out what remedy we need to go with here. Do we even need a remedy right now? Is this real or is this I woke up and I got a little bit of discomfort, but I could probably go back to bed. So right. it just helps when you can stay on the same page. When you both have the education, I may recall something uh, that we could do here or she might recall something. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think being able to support each other because there's a little bit of a learning curve. Yes. And I think that discourages a lot of people. But if you can push through that mm-hmm. and you can start developing some confidence, oh, I've seen this before. My wife takes really good notes anytime we have an issue. and so. If my son gets into poison ivy, yep, he had this last summer, I remember. We can go back and look and see what ended up working and helping him. So I think supporting each other there, making good notes is what gives you that confidence moving forward. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think what you said to me, and I've said this before to people, if you can just push through the overwhelming information for just a couple of weeks, really not even that much, just get over that hump it all starts connecting and making sense. And like you said, it becomes muscle memory because you remember things and it all just kind of comes to you when you need it. So that's great. So why don't you tell us some stories about your family? It sounds like homeopathy came just in the nick of time for some issues that you guys were facing. Absolutely, yeah. I got a few stories I could tell you. One that we jumped into pretty quickly, we realized that uh, homeopathy could help with uh, eczema. And that's something that my daughter had struggled with since she was one and a half, two years old. And so we did all the steroid creams and all the medications. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has any experience with that knows that uh, allergies and asthma and eczema is all kind of twisted together in this big knot. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we are in the process of unraveling right now. But the first thing we were able to do is kind of deal with the eczema. Like I said, it's been something she struggled with for a long time. And when we first started, I'll admit that when you start to get that understanding of homeopathy and you kind of work backwards, especially in something like that, that's been chronic, something she's dealt with her whole life. And so at first, her eczema flared up quite a bit. It makes you a little nervous when you see something like that. Being on the other side of that now, knowing that it's getting a little worse before it gets better because you are flushing it out of your body, you're doing the right things, but that can be a little scary the first time through. And so seeing her hands and her feet the way that her skin looked was not the most pleasant thing to watch a child go through. But I can tell you being on the other side of that now, her skin is clear. And if she ever has a little spot pop back up, we know exactly what we have to do. In in the winter and all the times when she typically is kind of suffering through some of that, we don't have to go through all of that with the creams and the lotions and all the things that we used to do. Knowing that we can fall back to homeopathy is a pretty cool thing. Yeah, that is awesome. I find that with eczema and Joette, she used to be blanketed with eczema. She really has a lot of experience with this. And so she has a soft spot in her heart for people who suffer through it. But she's talked a lot about one of the reasons people's eczema gets so much worse at first before it gets better is because you're coming off of the steroid cream. And it sounds like your daughter didn't go through a withdrawal, but some people go through a withdrawal. If you want to learn more about this withdrawal, you can go to this website called IT, like Tom, S like Sam, A, N like Nancy, it's San. And it basically talks about topical steroids. And when you stop using them, you can go through these withdrawals. And I have a friend whose daughter went through it. I mean, it was like she almost looked like a burn victim from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet, not because it was eczema anymore, but because her body was kind of going through this terrible, terrible steroid withdrawal. So that's really good. That It sounds like your daughter didn't go through that. 
And my friend, she used only like a little dime size once every other week on her daughter. And her daughter still mm. went through this horrible, horrible withdrawal from the steroids. And you just never know what your body's going through. So it's just so wise that you guys knew you wanted to get off of this and that you wanted to find a better way. And that's a blessing really for your daughter. I do want to ask you this. Did you guys ever waver? Was it like an uphill climb, just pretty you know, smooth and predictable? We questioned a lot on that one just because the way her skin kind of flared up the eczema didn't look good. It was pretty rough. And so that one, yeah, we definitely were wondering if we were doing doing the right thing there. But like I said, being on the other side of it now and seeing how her skin looks now and that she's in great shape as far as the eczema goes, it was definitely worth it kind of pushing through that. And that's exactly why I think it's so important for couples, husbands and wives to kind of have a conversation about homeopathy, because there are times where things get a little stressful and you really need to talk it through and figure it out. And it's really hard to have that conversation when husband is staunchly against and wife is staunchly for. It's important, I think, to have these conversations in the study group class. We talk about when you suppress an illness, it drives it deeper. And a homeopath who treats someone with asthma who has had eczema as a child, they don't see asthma as asthma. They see asthma as suppressed eczema. Now, not everyone who has asthma had eczema as a child, but that's just an example of when you suppress the eczema, it drives the illness deeper and it gets into the lungs and they can develop asthma. Okay, well, tell us another story. Sure. That was more of kind of a chronic issue that mm -hmm. we dealt with, but I can give you one that's quite a bit different. My mother-in-law took a little spill and broke her shoulder. She immediately went for aconite, we had to go to the emergency room, of course, and get x-rays, and it was a pretty bad broken shoulder. They, uh, of course, wanted to offer her pain medication. She had taken aconite at home right when the spill mm -hmm. happened. Uh, she, she knew to grab that. Uh, and then in the emergency room, actually used Arnica Montana. Good for and, her. And yeah, was able to kind of make it through that ordeal with very minimal pain medication. It's a longer story than that. The doctor opted not to do surgery, wanted to see what would happen if it healed on its own. And she took a couple of different remedies, I believe it was uh, hypericum and then... Symphytum probably? Yeah, to help heal bone and for bone growth. And so she was able to go without surgery and use those. And so they were doing x-rays along the way. So we could see the x-rays, we could see the bones growing and moving back together. And so, wow. yeah, to go with a severely broken shoulder, to go through that without surgery, without a lot of medications that they wanted to put mm -hmm. her on was mm -hmm. a pretty cool story there to see all that happen. Right. Because the default there, you go to the emergency room and they want to give you pain medication. Well, you're in pain. That seems like they're really trying to help you. It seems like the right thing to do to take that pain medication. And then surgery, the doctor does x-rays and tell you that you need surgery. This one opted not to do that. But I guess it's back to that questioning and just making sure we're asking the right questions. What I like about homeopathy is it puts us a little bit more in the driver's seat in terms of, does. of those decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you said something that's really important and I want to reiterate it. Sometimes asking the wrong question gets you the wrong answer. And so it is important to know how to ask the right questions to your doctors so that you can have control over the situation. I'm so glad she's feeling better. Does she have full range of motion and back to normal now? Getting there, getting there. Because they let it heal on its own, the doctor was up front and said, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend surgery. You may not get full range of motion. You're going to get most of it back without okay. surgery. That was his belief. And so she didn't quite have full range of motion. But I'll be honest, if she had had surgery and just the rehab from that, I don't know how much better off she would have been. All the risks that go with surgery as well. Absolutely. That's exactly right. And that's kind of how you have to think of it. I just want to give an example of the wrong question kind of gets you the wrong answer. Talking about talking to your doctor. I always caution people about whether or not they share with their doctor about homeopathy or even asking them questions about homeopathy. You know, I took this to my doctor and he said that there's nothing out there that would help my bones heal. I'm like, well, you're asking the wrong question to the wrong person. And so you're going to get the wrong answer. That's really what it is. And if you don't kind of rationally think through these situations, who you're talking to, what you're asking, you're, you're going to get the wrong answer. And that only hurts you. All right. So tell us another story, Casey. Yeah. So those are kind of big deals for us. Those were, mm -hmm. those were big ones. But then like just everyday things, I can give a couple of examples. If we feel something coming on, we always keep cold calm handy. Mm -hmm. That has looked a couple of things that were coming on very quickly, kind of prevent it from coming on. So we always keep that on hand. Uh, it awesome. works well for us. Good. I um, actually don't have that one. I need to get it. Is it a Highlands brand, cold calm? I think that's boron. It comes in, okay, um, it doesn't come in the typical tube. It comes in a box mm -hmm. and the instructions on there are great. It tells you how many to take it first and then every few hours. 
still dissolves into the tongue, but it's more of a pill looking. It's a little larger than the little pills we're all kind of accustomed to. But yeah, definitely works well. And then a couple of other things. My son was doing either yard work or playing in the woods, something, and he got into some poison ivy Mm -hmm. and got into it pretty good on his stomach and arms. We were able to use homeopathy for that to not have to put all kinds of creams and lotions or go to the doctor for a steroid. It was nice to be able to treat that at home. We also use it for little aches and pains. I've got some issues in my back and shoulder. And so mm-hmm. I've got a couple of go-tos for myself. I've got Rust Tox and Rudagrava that mm-hmm. I use for those little things. That's kind of on a practical thing where I would have probably gone to Advil, something like that. Now I go to ice and homeopathy. <laughs> awesome. That's yeah. great. Actually, one of the other dads that I interviewed, Mark, he's like you, a pretty avid sports guy <laughs> so for the funny thing with him is he doesn't even really know exactly he says the, me and the kids will all line up like baby birds and open our mouth and my wife will just drop stuff in our mouth for whatever we need and they just kind of trust her going back to the poison ivy did you guys use anacardium for your son i want to say we used um aconitum and rust tox for that interesting okay. um, if i recall correctly yeah very good that's interesting because Roost Tox is the homeopathic remedy made from poison ivy. And if you take the study group class that Joette offers, you learn how it's diluted. In its homeopathic preparation, it's not toxic at all. But for some people, the Roost Tox works quite well, even though it's a remedy made exactly from what you're suffering from. In homeopathy, usually you look for the laws similar, not the laws of exact. And so anacardium, which is not made from poison ivy, is usually what helps people in a poison ivy situation. So I just like to throw these little factoids out there while people are listening so they can, you know, learn a little bit about homeopathy too. So, all right. Yeah, it is. It's great. So what about for headaches? My wife takes calibicronium, uh, particularly she's susceptible to like when weather's coming in, Mm -hmm. you know, high pressure, low pressure. I don't know which one triggers a headache, but I just know that when like a high pressure or low pressure system comes in, it changes the barometric pressure for her calibricronium. I remember back even um, Christmas Eve, she got a pretty good one. And so that was able to help her out. And then we do some other things too for food allergies. That's a new one we're kind of working through and uh, trying to figure that out. But uh, Bovista is one that we kind of go to for that, to try to deal with that. My daughter, when she eats an apple or something like that, that's not a major issue. It's just her lips get kind of itchy. Just little things like that. Having go-tos, you start to kind of develop your toolbox of right. um, things that you can go to. <laughs> I know. And people always ask me, like, which one of Joette's courses do you think is the best one? Which one should I take? And I firmly believe that if you are passionate about this, you work through and take every single one of those courses. Because, I mean, the Survivalist Guide is probably one of my favorite because it addresses some pretty extreme acute things. But, you know, the good gut, bad gut talks a lot about food intolerance, like you're saying. So, very good. Well, Casey, you're an awesome dad. You've got audacity (laughs) to take over your family's health, your wife, and to work through these things. I think your family is going to be blessed for generations. Joette says this, that homeopathy is generational because you're not just blessing your here and now, you're blessing your kids and your daughters are healthy and your grandkids are going to be healthier and hopefully that passes down. So good for you. And I really appreciate you taking time to talk with me here on the podcast. Oh, it was my pleasure. Okay, so that was our interview with Casey. Thank you so much. And before the interview, Casey told me about how he really believes in the power of story. And I think you're right, Casey. I really think that's these stories that will provide the future for homeopathy and for health in a lot of families. So thank you so much. Now, on to our second guy, who is Mark. So I'm happy to be here with Mark B. from New York. How are you, Mark? Hi, good, thanks. Good. Tell us what line of work you're in. I repair furniture. Awesome. And you are a pretty avid sports guy. Am I right? Yeah, I like to run and take part in races. I like soccer in the winter. Mm, in the winter? Yeah. Uh, well, indoor soccer. Oh, and okay. I, I, I bike and run um, in the other months. Are you training for any specific event right now or just finish? Yeah, I've got a half marathon coming up Memorial Day weekend. Okay, cool. Very good. Mm-hmm. It'll be nice and warm. And then you have a few children, right? Three kids, two boys, nine and two. And then my girl is in the middle. She's five. Okay, awesome. So you have been around the natural medicine block for a while now. Yes. And I think you told me that it's thanks to natural medicine that you met your wife. Yeah, we both were working at the same little health food store. Oh, you guys were working there together. (laughs) 
How cute. <laughs> okay, I wish I could say, I'm, I think a lot of women now who do homeopathy on Joette's, you know, paradigm, wish they met their husbands in a natural health store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't meet in a bar. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little bit, op almost the opposite. It's kind right. of funny. That's cute. I, when you guys told me that, I thought that that just couldn't be more perfect. So um, but let me just kind of back up and remind us why we're doing this podcast. The gears in a man's brain obviously turn differently than a woman's does. And I found that this podcast really needs mm. the voice of some men and their perspective on homeopathy. So thank you for coming and sure. participating with this. Okay, but something interesting that you've told me is that you're not really interested in changing people's mind. That's not your personality as far as homeopathy goes. Yeah, I wouldn't want to convince somebody. Uh, preach. I'm not, I'm not a preacher. Okay, and why is that? Yeah. Well, um, I think that what everyone believes is right for them in that moment. You know, so for me to come in and say, actually, you should believe this, yeah, it's, it just doesn't, uh, I don't think that's how people change, that's how minds change. Mm hmm. I think that's very fair. And I guess for you and your experience, what does it take to change your mind about something? Ultimately, mm -hmm. choice. But choosing to be open to a new perspective, a new possibility that, you know, doesn't prove your old way of thinking wrong, but just, ex, you know, expands on it. And yeah, it may prove it wrong in the long run. I mean, you just got to be open to new perspective is how I like to see it. Yeah, I like that. It's almost like being open to allowing yourself to evolve, permit, yeah. permitting the evolution of the self and, and new ideas. And that's really kind of what I think homeopathy is for a lot of people is they've evolved in their thinking and, you know, let's try something new, like you said, and being open to that choice. So let's get into this. You do feel like you have some experiences that you could share with homeopathy that our listeners might find interesting. So why to you does homeopathy have value? I believe the way I see homeopathy is it doesn't do the healing. It directs your body to do the healing on its own. Mm -hmm. And so you have faith in your body then. Yeah, and if I were asked to talk to a skeptical husband mm -hmm. about homeopathy, I would just ask him, is his faith or his belief in healing, is it in the traditional medical industry, in his doctor, let's say? Is that mm -hmm. where your faith in healing is? It's fine. What if your body could do it better than your doctor? Mm -hmm. And um, I think homeopathy is a great path to understanding self-healing? Well, I find, at least for me, you know, I've had a lot of chronic health problems. I don't know if you, if you share that, but so what happened for me is I had a lot of mistrust with my body, miscarriages and, and chron, you know, itching all over, just terrible chronic things that happened to me. And I developed a very real mistrust for my body because it proved to me that I couldn't trust it. But you're right, homeopathy opened that door that I could find a path back to that place of innocence that I had before my chronic stuff started coming up, where, oh, like, I can trust it. Precisely. And you know, actually, this is a thought that occurred, because knowing that this was coming up, I thought on the skeptical husband front, if I were to just remind him that, you know, we accept, oh, well, babies and kids, the bodies just heal faster. Mm -hmm. You know, they can heal anything. They're... They're just, they, they're resilient, right? We just attribute it to youth. And maybe, maybe it is the physical body itself, but maybe it's the fact that they don't dwell in fear and doubt like we do. And so I think homeopathy can be a way to send a clear message to your body like, hey, you know, do this. Rather than, you know, the, the clouding our, our thoughts with fear and doubt, I think can confuse the body on what it needs to do. And maybe that's why we don't heal as fast. Just a thought that crossed my mind today. No, I think that's right. And, and kids almost, they don't care about, you know. Exactly. I mean, you, you guys were telling me about your son today. He has an ear infection right now, but he just wanted to play with his buddies. And, you know, they just kind of let their body do their thing until they get sick and they go to mom and then mom helps them out. 
to some degree, it's, it's okay. Whereas I think an adult even feels a little pinch in their ear and they're freaking out and they're going right to the doctor for the antibiotics or whatever, you know, they, I think we kind of react a, a lot quicker than we need to. Yeah. It shows you where, where their faith is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Their faith like is that. in their, uh, in their doctor. Yeah. I mean, yes, you're right. It goes right back yeah. to that mistrust we were talking about. Very good. I want to jump ahead and talk about what situations have you found homeopathy to be beneficial for you in your lifestyle, your family? Sure. You know, my wife, she'll use homeopathy for a lot of things with herself and with the kids, whether it's rashes for herself or an earache, <laughs> right. whatever the kids are going through just to address it somehow. Right. So for me, I, I really will only pursue homeopathy for like sports injuries. Like I broke a toe five weeks ago. And so I would take homeopathy to speed the bone healing. And then once the bone healed after a couple weeks, I found that it still hurt. And well, it's the sprain because it dislocated. So the sprain I've heard takes longer. And so then I've been on a protocol for, you know, the ligaments to heal and, and um, the swelling to go down. And so my personal experience is really, yeah, it's just um, physical healing, bone and, mm -hmm. and muscle and ligaments. Because yeah. we have those strenuous, I mean, it sounds like a strenuous workout schedule for your competitions and everything. You know, that's, a, that's another story. I'm actually going, I'm training too hard. You actually, I think like anything, in everything in moderation right you should start where you're at and just go from there but for me i, I just i push i've been pushing it too hard is all mm -hmm. i would love to share that protocol i'm guessing you used symphytum for the bone when it broke i'm so sorry you broke it <laughs> yes yeah, symphytum rust tox i don't know i like i don't know the details i just know that those two together do something a little different right so it's maybe it's your wife saying all right take this and you're like okay i trust you yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'll be the one who stays with it. Whereas, yeah, she'll just pop some remedies in my mouth if, mm -hmm. I, um, if I mention something without asking for it, yeah. Right, and that's so nice yeah. of that for you. <laughs> oh, it's so nice, yeah. So, Mark, a lot of men like data and facts. And so let's just look at your family as a microcosm of, you know, other families who use homeopathy. Um, how long have you guys been using homeopathy for now? about nine years so in those last nine years have you needed to go to a doctor for you know like these illnesses these injuries these these kind of things that i think a lot of other people have to see the doctors for no um, however before we've been doing homeopathy for these nine years well, i'm not familiar I did have with bursitis what is bursitis it exactly it sounds like a terrible knee. thing but Right. So I, I think there's bursa sacs in every joint. I might be wrong on that. Okay. Uh, but there's a bursa sac in the knee. And I, I guess, I, I wish I knew, I should know, but there, there was an, a bacterial infection, right, that mm -hmm. took off in that bursa sac. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, it can uh, affect the whole knee. The whole knee got red and okay. warm and swollen, but I stayed home uh, for, for almost two days, day, a day and a half doing garlic, doing things that I thought would just help my body address it. And the mm -hmm. thing just got more and more swollen, more painful to move. And that's, that's a case where we did end up going to the emergency room for an antibacterial shot in the knee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think if we had homeopathy, I think that would have taken care of it, but but um, my son had yeah. almost the same the beginnings of the bursitis flare up in his knee. It was warm, you know, and red, and and so my son started getting that. But, but now we had homeopathy, and my wife gave him a remedy, um, knowing I mean remembering that I had the same thing. Though she she gave him a remedy and um, no ER visit, it it, um, it died down. Yeah, I mean it worked, so that's wonderful. Yeah, I just, I, I should say too that for, for trauma that I'm not comfortable addressing on my own, that's what I love about modern medicine is they're really good with, uh, with trauma care. Right. That's definitely where I see the place of traditional conventional medicine in my life is 
Right. And um, yeah. Well, and we have a great podcast that I always refer back to. It's called, it was on discernment. And you really do need to have good common sense and discernment to know when this is an emergency, you know, or, or when this is something you can treat yourself. And a lot of it comes down to having the knowledge, you know, sometimes the diagnosis, knowing what it is, owning the remedies and having the knowledge for the proper protocol to use. And so that is really important. We're very lucky that if you don't have all those ducks lined up in a row, you can go seek out medical care. And so, you know, that's an important point you make. I guess my last question to you is, it sounds like, Mark, you have a lot more control in your life than other people do. I mean, you injure yourself when exercising and you have an option. Your kid starts getting bursitis, you have an option. Your kid gets an ear infection, you have an option. In what way does homeopathy give you the freedom to continue your life as you wish? I believe that I'm healing faster than I otherwise would have Mm -hmm. if I didn't take these remedies for ligament and swelling reduction. Um, right. So it's, yeah, it's given me the ability to uh, learn from my overtraining mistakes. Right. It's given you the, yes. it's allowed you to kind of in excess of your exercising routine, you know, enjoy it in excess. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, sh- and sure, you know, probably I would also add that, you know, if we're not taking the, the kids to the doctor as much, we're not paying into our insurance deductible as much so we're um we're saving some money there's there's a little freedom there too right and how would you like i mean it's friday night your kid has an ear infection how do you feel about spending the rest of the night in the er (laughs) sure yeah that's that doesn't sound really freeing to me (laughs) Right. right that's awful so well mark thank you so much i really appreciate you taking the time to kind of share your perspective on things and it's just really great to hear a different you know you're welcome Yes, put some testosterone into the podcast. So Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mark. And now we're on to our top secret final interviewee, Levi. So let's jump in and listen to that one. Hi, I'm here with Levi. I'm very happy to have you on the podcast here. Thank you for taking the time to join us. It's a pleasure to be here. So why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. You are all grown up. Yes, a little bit. Yes, I'm 59 years old this year. I'm originally from Brazil, born and raised in Brazil, and I graduated as an MBA in engineering at the Brigham Young University. Work a few companies, among others, Intel Corporation over in Arizona. And I have three kids and uh, seven grandkids now. Yeah. And right now, enjoy life working as a uh, purchasing manager in a company in Wisconsin. And I also enjoy the fact that I am a Boy Scout master. Oh, good. At your local church? Yes, yes. uh, And we meet regularly and and, then have all those uh, scout activities. And I enjoy the boys. Very good. So I'm really interested because a lot of the people we've interviewed in our podcast have been kind of in the middle age. You know, I'm in my early 30s and a lot of the people we've interviewed have been about that age. But I'm interested on your insight and your perspective on homeopathy and your health because you are a generation ahead of me. So tell us about your health. Well, right now I enjoy good health. I do go to the gym three, four times a week. I'm very active. I do a lot of yard working, a lot of trimming, a lot of pruning, and all those outside activities. Bike sometimes. And I really enjoy good health. No major issues health wise. Mm -hmm. And so, as you look to the future, what kind of goals do you have for your health? What do you want to do with your body, you know, as you get older? Um, The only thing I cannot do is stop aging, but. I could maybe do the best that I can to age properly, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then when I look around, I see a lot of people my age, they don't even work anymore. They're forced to retirement because they have issues like diabetes, cholesterol, or high blood pressure and things like this that comes with age. And then happily, I don't have none of those yet. I'll see a lot of people also dependent on drugs. They cannot move around. They cannot even travel sometimes because of the dependent on drug uh, or whatever. I would like to be happy by being free of drugs or free of any disease as stretches uh, as long as I can. Absolutely. 
so really your goal is to be drug free, healthy, independent, and what was the word you said you want to age? With quality of life. When I retire, I'd like to be a volunteer worker and, and do something out there to, mm -hmm. to maintain. Okay, I can go up and down and move around without major health issues. That's the goal. That's a really good point. People your age, when they do retire, they can still be a huge contribution to society, I think, in those volunteer type positions, helping the community. And if they don't have the health to do that, which a lot of them don't, they actually end up, I think, becoming the opposite, kind of a burden to their family because of their health issues. And of course, I think families should and ought to care for their older family members. But you're right, to have that health and ability to serve is way better <laughs> than the opposite. So very good. Um, okay, so let's talk about homeopathy. Is homeopathy something that is new to you or have you known about it before meeting? Oh, oh yes. As I said, I was born and raised in Brazil. And then down in Brazil is a very common thing. People have access to homeopathy. Poor people, rich people, everybody has access to that. And the good thing is that it's very affordable. And I grew up in a very poor family and health insurance was not available in my family. So anytime we have some symptoms like a sore throat or whatever issue that we had, mom would go to this pharmacy and I start using this uh, homeopathy to be able to uh, at least uh, see if we can fix the problem before we go to a doctor or even the hospital. I don't remember seeing the hospital in my whole childhood. And then every time me or any of my brothers uh, would have any health issues, my mom would go to the pharmacy and buy some homeopathy medication. And then we would use that. And then uh, we lived a happy life, a happy childhood. Poor, but with everything that we need. No major issues there. Now, you told me, I think, that your mom was also a nurse. Is that right? Yes. Being a nurse, she always would know the, the symptoms of somebody's getting sick. Mm -hmm. So at that point, she would rush to these pharmacies, which is very affordable, and then could get those and start immediately helping. That's how I grew up. For as far as I remember, I never took much of other medications because I was healthy. Right. Um, so what happened when you started having kids? At that point, uh, every time one of my kids would have some issues like a sore throat or a little fever or this or that, and then we also remember what my mom used to give to us. So I just went to one of these pharmacies and get proper homeopathic medicines. And then it's very common thing to have also doctors ready available. We visit the doctor and he give us uh, some advices on what kind of uh, homeopathy medication or remedies to fix whatever problem was going on. So this is really interesting. So you're telling me that you would see a homeopathic doctor or a regular doctor who knew how to prescribe some homeopathic medicines? No, mostly they were specifically homeopathic doctors. They oh, interesting. Did in the case of pharmacies, they usually have both in Brazil. Any, any pharmacy you go in Brazil, you'll find both medication. Oh, wow. Just side by side, get what you need. Interesting. Yes, Very yes. Interesting. There came a point, I think, in your life where you saw homeopathy kind of step out of the family life. You know, you grew up with it. It sounds like early childhood when you were raising your kids, the homeopathy was still present. But there came a point where homeopathy stepped away. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was when I was about 26 years old and I decided to immigrate to U.S. And at that time when I moved to U.S., first of all, those homeopathic remedies were not already available in pharmacies. And then also I was a poor student. I'm going to college and then uh, raising kids. And then when those needs would come around, in the beginning we brought a kit from Brazil and that kit had the most common stuff that we might need it. But when we ran out of those homeopathic remedies, and then we decided to move into the regular doctors because uh, there was nothing available. And whenever any issue would come, any, any sore throat, any, any fever, any common flu or cold would come, we'd have to go to a quick shortcut and using the regular doctors. Wow, that sounds so tragic that you guys brought a kit and then it ran out and then you guys did what everybody else did, it sounds like. Yes, uh, it was not fun, but when you were in an emergency and running up and down, having three jobs and 16-hour classes in college, it's kind of a busy life, so you yeah. need to go to the shortcut. Right, that's exactly right. At the time, did you believe that doctors were a better route for your family? Because doctors, especially in the U.S., they're highly respected, they're very educated, I know that they would spend many hours studying their practice. 
as your homeopathy kit ran out, did you feel like, okay, well, we should be seeing the doctors because they're better anyways. They're, they're highly educated individuals and it's better for my kids. No, no, not at all. Actually, I just went to those regular doctors because uh, that was the only availability I have around. Mm -hmm. uh, I always saw those homeopathic doctors as good doctors as any other doctor. I'm an educated person, so I kind of understand who those things are. Every time, even when the regular doctor would give me some sorts of medication, I made my own judgment on what to take, what not to take, because sometimes mm -hmm. reading all those ingredients and saying, no, this is not good for me, and, and then try to cope with uh, the symptoms as much as I can. When I was living under these uh, homeopathic doctors down in Brazil, I noticed that they would go for the root cause of the problem. When I came to U.S. using these regular doctors, they're always going for the symptoms, trying to fix the symptoms, not the actual root cause. Like if I am having a headache, they would go for the headache, not what's causing the headache. Right. And also, I noticed how expensive it is, regular doctors, especially in the United States. It's outrageously expensive. Down in Brazil, going to a regular doctor was not as expensive as it is here. Just to give an idea, when we moved to Wisconsin uh, two months ago, we decided to establish our family doctor. Mm -hmm. and we went to see this doctor, and the doctor asked me if I was married to my wife. Yes, so they invited us both into her office. And then we stay there, and they ask a few questions about health history and this and that. My wife's not sick. I'm not sick. And then we stay there talking about uh, those historical events in our lives about um, health. Mm -hmm. And then we stayed there about 20 minutes. And then uh, I was surprised that two weeks later that I received a over $500 bill for 20 minutes. 20 minutes times three is one hour. 500 times three is $1,500 per <laughs> hour. Whoa! It's a highly immoral system that we have in the U.S. as how much uh, money goes around. And, and I don't know exactly what details on what that money went for. I just know that we sit down for 20 minutes and just talk to the doctor. And she checked my wife's pulse and blood pressure, and that was it. Right. It didn't feel like a $500 visit for sure. She didn't hand you any gold bars or anything, right? I just told my wife, as soon as I got the bill, says, honey, I just got the wrong profession because uh, this <laughs> here is going $1,500 an hour. Something is wrong with this picture. And unfortunately, in U.S. Uh, today, there's a lack of options. The best thing to do is keep ourselves as healthy as possible, making sure that uh, we are eating well and then exercising and maintaining a healthy life, to not to use that system. Yeah. I think most families would prefer to go seek out natural ways to uproot the root cause, like you were saying, but those things can fall by the wayside if there's no available option. Here in the U.S., you really have to go looking for it. And I think that's what happened with you guys and your kids. It sounds like you came prepared, you did what you could do, but life is busy and it sounds like homeopathy kind of fell by the wayside as you guys got older. Yes. And for me to find any homeopathic remedies, I need to go on Google and find an internet and then order online because if I cannot cross town or go downtown and find somebody that can sell me those stuff. It's not like you have your local friendly homeopathic pharmacy anymore like you did in Brazil. And Joette talks about this. Joette says, look at what everyone else is doing and do the opposite. And in some ways, I think she's absolutely right. Because if you look at what everybody else is doing, and I think you saw this too, everybody else is probably going to the doctors when you came here to the U.S. And it's just what everybody does. And it's important to question what everybody does. And maybe you do need to turn around and walk the other way. Yeah, that's what I did about two, three years ago. I started having some acid reflux ah. and they started coming and was pretty bad. And then, of course, I went to the doctor and omeprazole was prescribed to me. So omeprazole is to help with acid reflux, like yes, GERD. It, yeah, it stops heartburn. Mm -hmm. And then I started taking omeprazole and then, then one day in conversation with my daughter on the phone, I mentioned to her that I was taking omeprazole. And then she starts telling me, no, you should not be taking those. So go there and look into the internet and see all those side effects of those medications. And I did go. My wife and I started reading and we were, whoa. And it's horrible things. I mean, and what did your wife call it? She, she said, basically, it causes... Dementia. <laughs> That's and, not and, good. And my daughter listens to Joette's podcast and then um, taking her classes. She was nagging me about uh, not to take omeprazole anymore. This prozole is so good. I mean, I take one and the rest of the day, nothing. But mm -hmm. uh, every time I would go sleep at night thinking about all those side effects, whoa, I think that I'd do something about it. So she planted a seed of concern in you, basically. Yes, I could not sleep well at night. Every time I would take one of those, I would regret. 
Last time I was in Brazil, I was talking to my brother and then he was taking a medication right in front of me there. So, and then he says, what you taking there? And he says, oh, Omeprazole, what do you need that? So for acid reflux, we start talking about it and ask him, how long have you been taking this stuff? Oh, as far as I remember, I don't know, 10 years now, I guess. And also I have another friend that takes Omeprazole regularly and he's saying that he takes several other medications and then Omeprazole kind of neutralizes the effects of those medications he's taking. So it's like the medications he's taking causes GERD, and then he needs the omeprazole to deal with the GERD. Exactly. exactly it's a side it effect is. with a side effect. So now you're on a bunch of medications to handle each other's side effects. That's crazy. I told him, it sounds like you're in a negative downward spiral with all this stuff that you're taking. Mm-hmm. And then one thing pulls the other one, and then eventually you're drowning on those medications. So when you thought about these friends of yours, these two in particular that you're talking about that take omeprazole, did you notice anything with their mental state? We're not saying that omeprazole causes dementia, but you're saying when you added up all the potential side effects, it sounds like it could cause dementia-like symptoms. And then actually talking to my sister-in-law, for instance, she's saying that my brother is sometimes not cohesive anymore. He forgets things. I mean, it comes with age. But reading those side effects of this drug, I can see some signs of those things in his life and also other people that I have around similar symptoms they're being experiencing. I don't know much about those things. I just see that uh, people, they have a hard time to remember things, kind of uh, going to a stage that life is not very happy or healthy. I just did some research on the internet here for omeprazole for some of the side effects. And I see that the label says it can cause confusion depression, feeling agitated, aggressive, hallucinations. I mean, so these are definitely mental issues. So when you got back from your trip to Brazil after seeing your friends. When I saw these side effects on people, and then I got scared. I said, I better pay attention to what my daughter is telling me because I don't want to go to that path. And, yeah. and my daughter decided to get me hooked up with some protocols that uh, would help me on that. Okay, so did you think it was going to work? No. First of all, I would have to stop completely omeprazole. And if I would forget one day to take omeprazole, I would go in pain. And sometimes I have to drive 20, 30 minutes back home at lunchtime just to get one of those or buy another pill in the pharmacy Mm -hmm. because I could not live without that. Just the idea of changing my omeprazole, something else, I guess would be bad news. So, So I was a little concerned about that. I have to work and life needs to go on and it's kind of hard. How can I live with heartburns and severe heartburns, actually? Mm -hmm. So you just felt like you were scared enough to try it. Then one of those nights when I was brave enough to say, you know what? I'm going to follow my daughter, whatever she's saying. And then I have to swallow my pride and go for it. And I did. My daughter hooked me up with Banerjee protocol. So can I share the protocol with our listeners? Yes, please. Okay, so the protocol that you used was Iris Versicolor. 200 C in liquid, and you took that four times a day before each meal. So that would include the three major meals and maybe like a snack, like an afternoon snack. Yep. And then if you had heartburn, and tell me if this is right, you would alternate Iris Ver 200 with MagFoss 6X every 15 minutes. So like if you were having a heartburn flare up, you would do the Iris Ver, then 15 minutes later, you would do the MagFoss. And then 15 minutes later, you switch back to the iris ver until there was relief. Actually, uh, in the beginning, I could not get any relief from those uh, protocols. And what I did was one day I would take omeprazole, the other day I would take those. And life was not fun. It was maybe two months straight having all those ups and downs, those flares and coming up and down. When you took the omeprazole, did you also take the homeopathy on top of it? No. One day I would take omeprazole, like in the morning, and in the afternoon when I have some flares, then I would take those protocols. I see. So for reference, homeopathy can be used in conjunction with medications. At least that's what homeopathic practitioners have said over the years. They don't cause any interaction with medications since they're so ultra diluted. But that's what you did. You just did one and then the other. Exactly. And then a week later, I decided to be brave enough to completely avoid omeprazole. Never touch that again. And then I kept on those protocols and that was not relief immediately, especially MagFoss. I would take them quite a bit, every 10 minutes sometimes. And sometimes uh, just took one and then 15 minutes later, there I was again with the same flares. 
I was persistent to that. In the past, I saw homeopathic medication working well. I had faith this thing might work too, but uh, I was not seeing much results on those. And then about a month later, I start seeing good results or improving. And then two months later, it was uh, half of what was before. And then within three and a half months, I was completely done with that. And to the point that I was taking maybe once every two days and then became once a week. And then today, last time I took one of those was uh, maybe five weeks ago. Wow. Completely fixed the problem. And then when I look in my medicine cabinet, I see there a whole bunch of those omeprazoles. I laugh at them. <laughs> <laughs> and then most of them already being expired because I don't touch them anymore. And then I don't eat anymore. That's great. That's and, great. And, and then once in a while, if I eat like something too uh, spicy, like if I go Mexican food or Indian mm -hmm. food or whatever, and then sometimes it gives me those little flares. I don't even take Iris Verse. I only go for Megfoss, maybe one or two little pills. And that's enough. Whatever I go, I just take with me and traveling and then just uh, make sure I have those just in case. But mm -hmm. lately, I've been completely free of both of those protocols and also happily out of those uh, omeprazole out of my so life. You see it, it's being uprooted. I think that's a really great story. And I think at the beginning when you were using the omeprazole and the homeopathy, you were kind of trying to decide what you really wanted to do. But I liked how you finally just said, you know what, I need to commit to this. I'm going to give this up and I'm going to really give it a try. And a month seems like a long time, right? It seems like a long time when you're in the middle of it during that hard time. But it sounds like one month of struggling through something is worth it when you look at the next 15 years of being free from this. Yep, yep, that's exactly what it is. I don't want to take medication at all. I don't take even Tylenol or anything. I don't take anything anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't have a need for those things. Right. And if I eat a little funny in one of these days, then I have to go for one of these protocols to help me out. But uh, it's rare. As I said, last time I touched it was about five weeks ago. That's great. At the beginning of our interview, you have said that you had a homeopathy kit that was brought from Brazil for your family that you use, and then it ran out. So do you have plans on getting your own homeopathy kit now? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm working on that. And uh, I don't know. Maybe Brazil is going to be less expensive the next time I go down there. I'm going to talk to my daughter first to give me a list of stuff that I should be having in my kit. And yeah, well, so usually the, if it's a kit, the pharmacy has done the research and they have the top most commonly used medicines already pre-selected in the kit. Usually you don't have to build your own kit. They come pre-assembled, which is nice. I guess I'm going to go for one of those and start changing my habits and moving to a healthier life. Very good. Should we confess to our listeners? <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to do this interview with you because we're trying to get dads with audacity, right? And you are my dad. <laughs> so, I am your father. <laughs> so I really wanted to interview you because I just love the story of how we did grow up with homeopathy in our early childhood, but it fell by the wayside and it's kind of made full circle back into both our lives and my siblings, and my mom uses homeopathy, and I just love that it's kind of re-entered our family. And Joette has said that homeopathy is a generational experience, and it blesses all the generations, and you can leave a legacy for your children and your grandchildren. And I just thought this was a really great little story to illustrate this idea that you can bless your family all around you. You can't keep homeopathy to yourself when you see people suffering and taking medications that could ruin their long-term health, too. So... Yes, uh, and I love you for helping me become healthier. Actually, if I could give you a parallel story on that, mm -hmm. as I mentioned in the beginning, I came from a very poor family. We are six children. Education was not a common thing, actually. I don't know anybody in my family or extended family that ever went to school, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I was uh, growing up, and I decided that schooling would be a very important thing for my life. I could see poverty everywhere because of lack of schooling. And, and in Brazil, it's very hard to go to school. It's very expensive. Only rich people can go to colleges, things like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I decided to be brave and break that chain of poverty. Because I did, my youngest one is going to college now. And then the, my oldest son has a PhD. Paula has her master's degree. And I believe that it takes courage to break a system that's created around you. Mm -hmm. It's a paradigm way to do it. And same thing with this health way of life. Whatever was imposed to your life, it doesn't mean that I should swallow that and go for it. I should question. By questioning this, that's what made me healthier, 
I do exercise. I try to eat as healthy as possible. Yeah. So I believe it's a paradigm shift. And those paradigm shift is everywhere in life. In my case, education was one big one. Another one is back to homeopathic medication. I really like that analogy about the paradigm shift. So that's very wise advice. Well, thank you so much, Dad, Levi, for being on the episode for Joette. And if you are listening and you know a dad that has audacity like Levi or the other dads that we've interviewed, we would love to hear from you. Just contact us at podcast at joettecalabrese.com. That is podcast in the singular form, not plural, at joettecalabrese.com. Well, thanks again, Levi. Thank you. Love you. Bye-bye. Oh, I love you too, Dad. And for Joette's listeners, I really hope you enjoyed this podcast, and I hope you found it as enriching and beneficial as I did. And for sure, I want to encourage you moms out there listening to get your hubbies to listen to this podcast, and maybe it will get their gears turning in a new way if they hear the perspective from some dads with audacity. Thanks. Are you or someone you know a mom with moxie? Well, we're on the hunt for you. And of course, we don't want to hear just from moms, but from anyone who uses and loves homeopathy. Reach out to my podcast team and let us know why you're a mom with moxie. For more information, contact podcast at joettecalabrese.com. Mm-hmm.